told you that a, a Christmas day in Christian churches around the world, it's tradition to read the, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is God's word. You may be seated. Dear friends of Jesus, have you heard the, the true story of the real Saint Nicholas? Talking about the real person behind that, that other person that we're not going to mention today in our Christmas service. St. Nicholas was a, a real person who lived a long time ago. He was a Christian pastor who died on December 6th of the year 343, about 1,700 years ago. And the real St. Nicholas was known as being a very generous person. One of the stories that's told about him is he knew a, a poor father who had three daughters. And so at three different occasions, in the middle of the night, secretly, St. Nicholas went and he threw a bag of money into their window secretly. No one knew it was him. Not a chimney. Through the window. And the father used those three bags of money to allow his daughters to, to get married. And this reputation for being generous, it, it followed St. Nicholas even after he died, so that as time went on, Christians began to, to take up the tradition of giving each other gifts on the anniversary of his death. On December 6th. You can probably figure out the rest of the story from there. But St. Nicholas is known for something other than just being generous. St. Nicholas was one of the Christian pastors who was present at the Council of Nicaea in 323 AD. You maybe haven't heard about the Council of Nicaea, but you have heard that word before. Because here in our church we say the Nicene Creed. You heard that? The Nicene Creed, we use it just about every Sunday that we have the Lord's Supper. The Nicene Creed came from the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And in those days, there was a, a big challenge in Christianity. There was a big debate. There was a Christian bishop, a Christian pastor named Arius, who was going around teaching that Jesus is not equal with God the Father. An idea was spreading everywhere. Jesus is not equal with to God the Father. As Arius taught that, he gave some reasons for it. First of all, he said, no, no son is ever as great as his father. And there might be some sons that would want to dispute that, right? The second thing that Arius said is, no son is as old as his father. And that one would be pretty hard to argue with. And so at the Council of Nicaea, Christian leaders from all over the world met to discuss this question, who is Jesus? And it said that in the streets of Nicaea, there was a saying that was floating around. And the saying was, there was a time when he was not. There was a time when Jesus was not. This was the question. Who is Jesus? St. Nicholas was at the Council of Nicaea. And he made his presence felt. Any of you ever heard what St. Nicholas did at the Council of Nicaea? There's a famous story. It might be a legend. We're not sure. It's not in the Bible. It might not actually be true. But the story goes that the Council of Nicaea, the debate about who Jesus is, 
got so fierce that in one moment, St. Nicholas stood up and he walked up to Arius and he slapped him in the face. He was that insulted that anyone would question whether Jesus is equal to God. He slapped him in the face. Now, I'm not saying that that was the right thing to do. And I'm not telling you to go out and slap people in the face. Right? I know how you think. Right? It'd be easy for you to walk, hey, on Christmas Day, our pastor told us to go slap people in the face. It's not what I'm saying. Don't go out and slap people in the face. But that action showed how important Jesus was to St. Nicholas. The real St. Nick wasn't just a generous person. He was someone who was willing to stand up for the truth of God, even to the point of slapping heretics in the face. Was he right? Not about the slapping part. But was he right about who Jesus is? If we want to know who Jesus really is, where do we need to go? To the Bible. We need to look in the Bible. The Gospel of John doesn't start with the story of the shepherds and the angels. Luke had already written that down. So when Jesus' disciple John started his story of Jesus, he uses some of the simplest words in the Bible to express profound truths about who Jesus is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. John gives Jesus an, an interesting name. He calls him the Word. And when you think about it, that's a perfect name for Jesus. Jesus is the Word who reveals God to us. Remember the big question at the Council of Nicaea is, who is Jesus really? Here's what John says. The Word was God. Is Jesus really true God? Yes. That baby born in a manger, that man who grew up and lived 33 years on earth and died on a cross and rose from the dead. According to the Bible, he is true God. The Word was God. But John also says the Word was with God. So which is it? The Word was God or the Word was with God? It's both. How does that make sense? is the Trinity. You know about the Trinity, right? We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is God, and He's God together with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Was Arius right by claiming that Jesus wasn't equal with God? No. He was wrong. It was a false teaching. Jesus is God. He's God together with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. Since when? Do you hear what John writes? He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. How long has Jesus been around? It's the beginning. It's forever. Remember the, the saying that Arius started? He said, there was a time when he was not. Is that true? No. Christmas isn't the start of Jesus. Even creation itself wasn't the start of Jesus. As God, Jesus has been around forever. He was with God the Father way back in the beginning. I tell you how John uses simple words to explain the profound truths of the Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is true God. But it's not all he is. John goes on to say, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This true God took on human flesh and became a human being. Jesus has been true God from eternity, but he became truly a man on, on Christmas. That's what makes this day so special. Today, Jesus became a, a man, a human being. Like you and me. And just, just think about how remarkable that is. The God of the universe, who is bigger than heaven and earth, somehow fit himself into a seven or eight pound baby. 
Can you figure out how that works? The Word of God, through whom the world was created, suddenly became so small that all he could give out were little infant cries. The Word became flesh. This is what God promised way back in the book of Genesis. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned, God gave them the promise that the offspring of Eve would crush the devil's head. God had to become a man to crush the devil's head. This is what Isaiah was talking about when he, when he called Jesus Emmanuel. Remember what Emmanuel means? God with us. This true God took on flesh and became a, a true man. The Word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. The Greek of John is, is so easy that when I was first learning Greek at, at our college of ministry, Martin Luther College, this first chapter of John was the first part of the Bible that we got to actually study in Greek. If you can imagine spending years and years trying to learn a language and then finally being able to use it to study God's Word, it was pretty cool. And as we remember, as we, as we studied these first verses of John, we got to that phrase, He made His dwelling among us. And even though we didn't know Greek very well, something jumped out at us. It was the word tent. One of the first words in Greek we learned was tent. I don't know why, but that's what we learned. And when you get to this verse where it says he made his dwelling among us, what it really says in Greek is he put up his tent among us. He tented. Isn't this a cool thought? Jesus put up his tent here among us. He said to all of us here on earth, you all live down here? All right. I'll live here too. He set up his tent. What's so special about Christmas? Martin Luther once said that, that at Christmas in, in Christ, God became flesh. He said, compared to that miracle, all the other miracles don't matter much at all. So as we think about all the things Jesus did, he turned water into wine, he walked on water, he healed people with leprosy. None of those, none of those compare with the fact that God became flesh. We teach our kids not to look at the sun. Why not? Too bright. Right? You'll burn your eyes. Don't look at the sun. And yet God is so much brighter than the sun, we could never look at God face to face. And so what did God do? He became a little baby. So that we could see the glory of God. We talk often about how a sinful person can't stand in the presence of our perfect God. We heard that last night about the shepherds being terrified when they saw the angels. And so what did God do? made himself into a little child so that we could even hold him in our arms. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son. A baby in the manger, he is true God and he's true man. And Jesus didn't just become a human being so that we could see God's glory. That tells us exactly why Jesus came. He says, In Him was life, and that life was light to all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus came to bring life and light. So two things that our world desperately needs. We live in a world of darkness. The Bible calls it sin. There's this darkness inside you and me. The guilt and the shame and the lust. There's this darkness that, that lives around us. This, this anger and violence and bitterness. There's this darkness that impacts our whole world. Sickness and pain. Jesus came to bring us light. Later in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus didn't just bring light. He brought life. Did you see on the news this past week that life expectancy in the United States dropped again this past year? The average American now lives to be 76.4 years. It's the shortest the average lifespan has been since 1996. If you read the article about it, it'll talk about how we really need to fix this. We really need to, to get back in the right direction. We need to add some more months onto that. The answer, of course, is just to move to Canada. People in Canada live to be 81 years old. Did you know that? 
five more years. But hopefully when you think about this, you say this is kind of foolish to add a couple more months on or a couple more years on. That's not really the solution, is it? The death. Whether you live to be 76.4 years old or 81, every one of us is going to die. But Jesus brings life. Later in John, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Jesus brings us light and life. Isn't this good news? That's why at Christmas we read that lesson from Isaiah. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet that bring good news. There's so much good news about Jesus. But in the middle of all the good news, there's a little surprise. John tells us all of these profound truths about Jesus. He says, He was in the world, and though the world was made through Him, the world did not recognize Him. That's a surprise with all the things that Jesus has done for us. The, the world did not recognize Him. Isn't that the truth? We heard how through Jesus all things were made. And the world says, nah, we come from fish. John says that Jesus came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And the world says, no, there is no truth. What's true for you is not true for me. Heard that Jesus is the one and only Son. And the world says, no, all gods are the same. There's lots of different paths. It's all the same God. This came... But the world did not recognize him. So that that's not the worst part. It's easy for us to say, come on, world, get with the picture, right? That's not all that John says. He says, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. It's not just talking about the world. It's talking about us. Every one of us, inside of us, there's a part of us that absolutely rejects the Word of God. And who is the Word of God? It's Jesus. Every one of us knows the light. And yet how often don't we choose instead to live in the darkness of sin? Jesus comes to the world and He says, I'm coming to save you. I'm going to bring you forgiveness and peace and eternal life. And we say, nah. No thanks came to that which was his own. But his own did not receive him. This is why Jesus has to be true God and true man to save us. We need someone to save us. He has to be true man so that he can take our place. So that he can live in our place. So that Jesus could be tempted just like we're tempted. So that Jesus could suffer just like we suffer. He had to be a human being so that he could save us human beings. But he had to be God so he could be perfect. So when he was tempted, he never sinned. When he suffered, he never complained. He never doubted. He never failed. He was our perfect Savior, God and man. And Jesus had to be a man so he could die on the cross. Because that's what we really deserve for our sin. We deserve death and hell. If Jesus was going to save us, he had to die our death. He had to be a human being to die for us on the cross. But he had to be God. So that when he died, that death counted for everybody. You could crucify me. Hopefully not on Christmas Day. That'd be kind of a down. Right? But you could crucify me. And if you did, how much would my death count for? Someone you'd say a lot. Right? <laughs> right? But nobody did. It would count for one life. My death would count for... For one person, for me. Yet when, when God died on the cross, how many people did his death count for? Everyone. Because how much is God's life worth? Worth it all. Right? This is why Jesus had to be true God and true man to be our Savior. And here's the promise. To those who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This is a promise that the Bible holds out to you and me. To those who, who believe in Jesus, 
We get to become the children of God. There is nothing more special than that. Right? At Christmas, you get to see a parent's love for their children. And just think about God's love for you and me. Jesus is the one and only Son of God. But Jesus didn't want it to stay that way. Jesus wants as many people as possible to be the sons and the daughters of God. And so he offers us this promise to you who believe in Jesus. You have the right to become the children of God. Isn't this special? Isn't this good news? Isn't this something worth standing up and, and defending? In our world today, what we hear around us is this. It doesn't matter. All gods are the same. Don't argue about little things in the Bible. That's just your interpretation to each his own, right? You know what St. Nicholas would have said? He would have said, no. Don't insult my God. Don't change who Jesus is. True God and true man, our Savior. I wonder if that's what made St. Nicholas so, so generous. What allows you to give things away? What allows you to care about other people? What allows you to not focus on all the stuff in this life on earth? It's knowing what Jesus gave up for you. But the very thing that made him generous is also what made him strong to stand up and defend the faith. What is it that leads us to stand up and defend the truth of God's word? It's that Jesus gave up everything for us. It's the Christmas message that makes you generous. It's also the Christmas message that makes you strong. Defend the faith. Hopefully you, you figured out how the Council of Nicaea ended up. Thankfully, by God's grace, those who stood for the truth of the Bible, they expelled Arius and those false teachers. And one of the results of the, the, the Council of Nicaea was the Nicene Creed, which Christian churches still use all over the world today. When we say the, the words of the Nicene Creed here at church, I, I hope you don't look at it like some filler, like we, something we got to get through so we can finish the service. These are words of light and life. It's the truth of our salvation. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. There is no doubt about who Jesus is. He is true God and true man, our Savior. Amen. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, throughout the, the history of the world, people have argued about who you are. There's always been false ideas like Arius, his idea that you're, you're not the same, you're, you're not as, as eternal as God the Father is. We're thankful, dear Jesus, that your word is so clear. You had your Apostle John write down these words for us. That you are God and you are with God, both. That you are God and yet you, you took on flesh to become a, a human being like us. Dear Jesus, help us ever grow in our knowledge of you, our faith in who you are, true God and true man, our Savior. Amen.